Are all hereditary peers male? Yes. So can a hereditary peer pass his peerage on to his daughter if his daughter is the eldest? Not if he has sons. So if he's got four daughters, super accomplished, yes, and they're in their 40s, but he's got one boy child who's only eight months old, yes, that's the one that gets it. I'm afraid so. Britain has one of the oldest systems of government in the entire world, but nobody sat down and planned that system. It's composed of numerous bits and pieces cobbled together over hundreds of years as the need arose. I'm John Burko, and for 10 years I was the Speaker of the House of Commons. I've seen our system of government at its best and at its worst, and I'm fascinated by who gets to operate the levers of power and what people do with them. In this series, with the help of Deborah Francis White, I'll be looking at different aspects of our modern democracy, how they began, how they work, and how much influence each of them has. And we'll try to answer the question, where does power really come from? This is Absolute Power. Hello, 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 and welcome to all who are listening on Her Majesty's Internet. I'm sitting here today with former Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko. Hello, John. Good afternoon to you, Deborah. And this is our podcast, Absolute Power, in which John is going to be my guide to the corridors of power, which he knows far better than I do, both metaphorically and literally. I've got no sense of direction and have twice been lost in the House of Commons. <laughs> You're not alone. I mean, did you ever take a wrong turn and end up in a in an unlikely situation? Yes, particularly in the early years, and particularly if I ventured from the green carpet of the House of Commons to the red carpet of the House of Lords to visit somebody or to attend a function, I frequently got lost. And it should come as some... Relief and comfort to you, Deborah, having admitted that you've got lost in the Commons, when I tell you that Tony Benn, the late Tony Benn, told me that in his last Parliament, which was 1997 to 2001, he discovered a new route <gasps> from one part of the House to another. And he had first been elected, if memory serves me correctly, in 1950. So no. you need not feel guilty. He found a new route 40 years later. Indeed. Are they like secret passages and they're like, are they like if you, you know, library, library bookshelves you can push on, spin around? Is it that kind of place? <laughs> Analogous to that, yes. I wouldn't say it's quite like that, but it is possible to find shortcuts from one place to another of which you were previously unaware. And I think that's what Tony was driving at. If you mean, are there bookcases that are really doors? Mm. I've not come across such. But who knows? It's a labyrinthine network there. So I suppose what I'm really trying to say is you shouldn't feel in any way guilty, feministically or otherwise, <laughs> or embarrassed about what I will describe as your nescience, yes, your I, state of ignorance. I, I figure I could work there for 20 years and still not know which way I was going. I've got no sense of direction whatsoever. I haven't got two spatial skills to rub together, if I'm honest. <laughs> but is there a lot of... Do you ever open a door... Well, and is there anything untoward going on? Because there must be lots of shagging and stuff that goes on. <laughs> is there? I'm sure. I can't say I've come across it myself. If you mean during my time in the house, have I ever Walked gone in. into a room and found people hard at it? Mm. No, but I would imagine there are plenty of tales from people who have witnessed such activities. So today we need your secret route to the House of Lords. Now, many of us have not been in the House of Lords. So can you first of all tell us what, in the most simple terms, is the House of Lords? The House of Lords is the second chamber of Parliament which participates in the legislative process. That is to say, it scrutinises bills. Some bills can even start in the House of Lords. And that's really in order to avoid what I would call legislative traffic congestion. In other words, if every bill were to start in the Commons, the Commons would be over congested. Mm. So some bills, government bills, will start their passage through Parliament in the Lords and then come to the Commons. Most start in the Commons, but a sprinkling will start in the Lords. And the main purpose of the Lords is to debate legislation and it can, as a chamber, revise legislation 
it can delay the passage of legislation, but ultimately it cannot stop legislation reaching the statute book. So the simplest of terms, a bill is when somebody proposes a law, say, I want to change the law, yeah. so I'm going to put this bill and see if we can pass it into law, Yes, and then everyone's going to have to obey that law. Uh, most bills come from the government of and, the day. And so... The government, whoever's in power, says, yep. we'd like to change the law in this way. Exactly. But they can't just change it. First of all, they have to take it to this other chamber. Yes, they and have to take it through both chambers. But if the Lords tries to amend the bill, which it can do, there can be ping pong, as mm. it's known, between the two houses. It is a pretty safe rule of thumb now, Deborah, that when ping pong is played, the House of Commons is the eventual winner. Why? Because it is the elected chamber and therefore it is regarded as the primary chamber. The House of Lords is not the only second chamber in the world. There are many democracies that have second chambers, but it is the only one that is larger than the primary chamber. It doesn't have a fixed size, but last time I looked, it had 783 members, whereas there are 650 members of the House of Commons. So it's bigger, but it is generally accepted that it is the second chamber, and because it isn't elected, it must ultimately defer to the first, the primary chamber. This is an interesting thing in a democracy, because as you say, most countries have a second chamber, but that second chamber is made up of more elected people. Why in this country is our second chamber made up of unelected people? And if they're unelected, who are they? Why is it unelected? I suppose that requires us to delve into the annals of parliamentary and British political history. Please take us into the annals. And the answer is that... I want a shortcut into the annals. Britain wasn't originally a democracy. Uh, there wasn't a, an initial belief in still less passion for democracy. Democracy came about gradually and democracy came about through grassroots protest and democracy came about through struggle. So if you go back into the mists of time, the House of Commons wasn't a democratically elected chamber. Small numbers of people with property qualifications or other had the right to vote. And the House of Lords was made up of people who were, as Edmund Burke would put it, which I know is a piece of snobbery, of noble birth. Mm. That is to say, it was populated by aristocrats. And for a very, very, very long time, the House of Lords was predominantly, not only an unelected chamber, it remains unelected to this day, it was predominantly a chamber made up of hereditary peers, several hundred hereditary peers, who were there because their fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers or great-great-grandfathers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, had been there and who had inherited the seat. So they'd inherited a title. So they were they were wealthy landowners who at some point that were given honours by the monarch of the day, become a lord or in some way or another an aristocrat because yes. they had money and they had some kind of affiliation to the royal yes. family. And so they were the people who decided on behalf of all the ordinary people, what went on. Yes. Now, at some point, not that long ago, people decided that's not cool. Can't just have people who've had money in the family for a long time uh, making all our decisions for us. So what happened then? Well, there were in the 20th century two major acts, the 1911 Parliament Act and the 1949 Act, which somewhat restricted the powers of the House of Lords. And in a very short summary, the effect of those changes was that it was much more difficult for the Lords to prevent due passage of legislation. The current situation is that the House of Lords can delay the passage of a bill, I think for up to two parliamentary sessions. It isn't usually more than a year that it would delay a bill of which it disapproved, in relation to which it asked the government to think again. There are also now very heavy restrictions on the Lords in respect of matters of money. So, for example, a bill that is designated by the Speaker of the House of Commons as a money bill, mm -hmm. a bill that is 
exclusively or almost exclusively focused on and preoccupied with the raising of revenue or the expenditure of funds, such a bill cannot be amended by the House of Lords. Right. So those are considerable constraints on the Lords. So there have been changes there. But isn't, it, a... isn't, it, isn't there a fundamental change, though, John, with who's allowed to be in the House yes. of Lords now? Ah, well, as always, you see, Deborah, I mean, it's inescapable. You are always ahead of me. And <laughs> this afternoon is no exception. I was travelling down the highways and byways of the United Kingdom in a nonchalant fashion, eventually trying to chug my way towards that point. But you have stopped me in my tracks and you have pulled me up and you have basically said in your extraordinarily polite way, let us get on to the other the, big the, matter, the, the matter of composition. Yeah, and composition changed really as a result of the Life Peerages Act of 1958. The Life Peerages Act of 1958 was what it described itself as being a bill which became an act that provided for the creation of life peerages, that is to say, a peerage that would last the lifetime of the person upon whom it was conferred. And they can't give it to their children. Beyond that person, exactly. And it's and those are not given on the basis of wealth, although sometimes very wealthy people get them. Oh, well, um, they're you're, most certainly not supposed to be. You're on making that basis. a face at me, John, that implies that that is not always true. Well, I they're mean, it is absolutely prohibited. Of course, you know, the purchase of peerages is illegal. There's been something in the news about this lately, hasn't there? Well, there's often speculation about and commentary about people who are known to be substantial donors to political parties ending up in the House of Lords. But we need to tread very carefully here because obviously. In order for a charge to be levelled that someone has effectively bought his way in to or the House of Lords or her their way, way in their way into the House of Lords, evidence has to be provided. The fact that somebody is a substantial donor and goes to the House of Lords isn't of itself a causal link. There may be all sorts of other reasons why that person has gone to the House of Lords. Equally, there may not be very obvious reasons why that person has otherwise. So do you suspect that Lords. some people have got into the House of Lords because they've donated a lot of money or without naming names? Well, it certainly looks like that. It certainly looks as To the untrained eye, to the naked eye. It certainly looks to the untrained eye, to the naked eye, to the even moderately suspicious or questioning eye. To the heavily trained eye. As though there is You have a heavily trained eye. Does it look to you like (laughs) It certainly looks quite peculiar that people who make substantial donations very often end up in the House of Lords. Easy to straightforward trade. Well, that's very, very difficult to prove. If you're in the House of Lords, what else can you do? Can you have parliamentary roles? Can you sit on select committees? Can you be in the cabinet? Can you be a whip? Is there anything else you can do? Yes. Broadly speaking... Government that you find in the Commons can be and is replicated, albeit on a smaller scale, in the Lords. So there are government ministers sitting in the House of Lords. Traditionally, there have been relatively few cabinet ministers, Deborah, because I think that there is a a feeling that the minister with overall responsibility for the department as Secretary of State, should ordinarily be Be answerable to the House of Commons. But there have always been some in the Lords, including, for example, in the Labour years, Peter Mandelson was a Cabinet Minister. He was originally a Cabinet Minister in the Commons, but he eventually went to the Lords and was a Cabinet Minister there. And there have been other examples. More widely, yes, there can be roles played by members of the House of Lords, that would be played in the House of Commons. So there are government whips and opposition whips in the House of Lords because party votes take place. And there is a structure of select committees, of Lords committees on which members of the House of Lords sit. So a good deal of what you see in the Commons, you see replicated in the Lords. There are, it has to be said, very, very large numbers of members of the House of Lords who are not particularly active and who probably don't serve on committees. 
that's always been the case. I think the general sense is, and I don't want to be in any sense pejorative about the Lords, but I think it's a statement of fact that there are thought to be something like 250 Lords, which is less than a third of the total membership, who are very active. Who come and vote on who everything. Who come and, and vote care. and who regularly speak yeah. and contribute to debates. So lots of people are amendments. absentees. There are a lot of members who don't go. Do they get paid? They don't get paid, but there is an attendance allowance. So, you know, they won't be earning anything unless they are attending. But there are members who attend rather briefly, claim the allowance and then leave. And what's, that now and again is the subject of media commentary. What's the allowance? It's about £300 a day. But if you turn up for half an hour, you claim the whole day? People can do that, and I, I'm told that that does tend to happen in some cases. I mean, it's outrageous when you see, you know, 20 quid being ripped here and there off single mothers in, you know, dire straits, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that you know, you I mean, it isn't for... currently the subject of commentary. I mean, these things go in phases, I suppose, mm -hmm. Deborah. But every so often there will be a row about Parliament or one House of Parliament or another House of Parliament, and that will feed the media mm -hmm. interest. Well, we can and start that round here. They do yeah. start to say, well, there are quite a lot of people who mm. come, come very briefly, but go away having claimed the allowance for the day. I, don't think I think I'm should... right in saying that members who live in London can't claim the overnight allowance. Oh, so if you people... want to come to the theatre but you don't live in London, you say, oh, go, go, go and do an hour and a half. <laughs> And then go shopping and then go and see... Well, that could happen. Go and see Back to the Future, the musical. Well, that by could the happen. way, gang, by the way, it's... it's. Uh, I mean, I, it's a cheese fest, but it's it's very impressive. How well, do I get a seat in the House of Lords, John? This is sounds... Well, like I don't know. I mean, we've got to take it in steps, Deborah, because I thought our principal ambition on your behalf was to secure your election to the House of Commons, where you would be a genuine tribune. I might buy... Now, in I might the bypass event that, that you decide to pass on it. that, no. you know, you could... Straight Say to, the to Lords. Keir Starmer, well, look, how about putting me in the House of Lords? I would be a most diligent and effective member. And so... I would turn up for more than an hour and a half if, if a day if I claimed to And I rather imagine that you would, and you would disport yourself with considerable panache uh, to the very great advantage of the nation. Well, how do I go about becoming a Lord? Do I have to be an MP first or I don't? Do no, I? Because you don't have there's to be... all sorts, like Alan Sugar... Yeah, you don't have of, to be a member of Parliament you first. Just, I mean, there are people who go you, to the Lords... Sold having computers, been Alan Sugar sold in the sold Commons, computers. and there are other people who go to the Lords then, having done other work, and it may be in the commercial world, it might be in the world of academe, it might be, just to give you an example, and it's quite common in the Labour Party, it might be in the field of local government. I mean, I don't know because it hasn't happened in my case, so am I closely familiar with the process? No, but I think the likelihood of just the being right chanced upon is not that... Hi, I would say on the whole, probably people who get there have either been beavering away beneath the surface, trying to take the temperature and to move the dial in their direction, or at the very least, they've not discouraged friends from doing so on their behalf, let's put it that way. And I can't afford it at the moment, but uh, say I make a lot of money on a TV show, how do I buy my way into the House of Lords? Who do I see? <laughs> is there an official process? Is there a website where I can go? Or is that more... You cannot buy down... your way in in but that way at all. There's it a... may be that you have made, as a result of the vast wealth that you've accumulated, a substantial donation to a political party, mm -hmm. and you have befriended that party, and you've been of service to that party, and you may have all sorts of other accomplishments to your credit of a public character or community activity character, charitable character, and over a period it will occur to some wise soul in that party, well, the time has come to place Deborah Francis White the time in the service and of the House of Peers. I've left my suitcase full of money in the right office in the Commons, <laughs> and, and next thing you know... This uh, overpowering, in... dominant cynicism... <laughs> Is mildly disquieting. I'm so sorry, John, but I can only I can only base uh, my belief system on what I see evident before me. Are there any peers who inherited their title still in the House of Lords? Or yes, yes, are, there are, are, because Tony Blair 
set out to make a major reform of the House of Lords when That's he came the one to power I can in 1997. And Blair came to office committed to some kind of House of Lords reform. And, and he did reform, but the main reform was to get rid of most of the hereditaries. And in order... In the to, nicest possible way, why didn't he just get rid of all the hereditaries? Well, because there was a massive bust-up between commons and lords, and the lords bid for the right for some to be preserved. And, and were and those in the name ones of avoiding active? a great big delay, I think that in the end, if I remember right, is what it was. Blair didn't want an unreasonable delay you know, for the thing to drag on unduly. And so Blair agreed to a semi-compromise whereby 92 elected by the House of Lords, in other words, those chosen by the Lords among, from the hereditaries, could stay and, and have succession rights, and have succession rights, you know, for their kids and so on. Oh, really? For their, yeah. For their children? I, I believe I'm right in saying that, yes. Oh, I thought yes. that was done. I thought Blair did away with you can't pass it on to your children. No, that right remains. George Younger was a Tory peer uh, who was made an hereditary peer, and his he died and his son ended up going to the Lords. I thought the people now in the House of Lords were all people who in some way or another earned their place. No, there are still, I think I'm right in saying... Or bought their place. <laughs> I think I'm right in saying there are still 92. That was the figure, and I don't know quite why the figure 92 was arrived at, but it was. The figure was arrived at that 92 hereditaries would be able to remain. Let me give you an example, and we probably oughtn't to personalise it, but let me give you an example. No, personalise it, go on. It makes it more dynamic. I, I had a constituency president called Miles Buckinghamshire, Lord Buckinghamshire, sometimes known as the Earl of Buckinghamshire. Miles Buckinghamshire, who, who's still very much alive, was a member of the House of Lords and I think would quite like to have remained as an hereditary, but Miles worked for a living. Although he was of aristocratic origin, he did actually work for a living. If He worked as an actuary for some city firm in London or whatever. And so the effect of that was that he wasn't in the Lords as often as he would like to have been. He did go, but he didn't go as often as some people. And therefore, I suspect that probably counted against him. When it came to the election of the 92, the peers tended to elect to stay those who had distinguished themselves by being extremely active. I.e. the ones that could afford to turn up every day because yes. they didn't need a job. Yes. So, ironically, the peers that might have had any sense of what it might be to go and have to do a nine to five and rely on the NHS because they were old money, got no money, were told no we don't need you. Well, sod off. I haven't thought of it in those terms, but now you make the point, I can tell you that it is entirely valid. Yeah. So so anybody yes, who right. ended up just, yeah, well, this has been in the family a long time, but we're we're not all wealthy as God anymore. Uh so could in any way, shape, or form relate to somebody who perhaps needed to wait for an operation on the NHS. They were all told, no, what what about these ones that are really good because they're here every day because they love the port? Those are the ones that got to stay. There is zero justification for this. I I actually, and I'm going to surprise a lot of people here, currently talk about abolishing the House of Lords again, that Keir Starmer said he would abolish the House of Lords and now he's sort of backing down on that. I personally like the Lords as a moderating force. Yeah. And I know that people are going to say, but they're not elected. And to that I would say that is why they often make a more humanitarian decision than the House of Commons because they're not playing to a populist vote. Sure. They don't have to be re-elected. So often they just go, this is just contravening human rights. And they don't have a heartland to go, we don't care about the human rights of refugees. We care about our constituency hoarding our resources. So I secretly, secret's out, this is I'm podcasting it out, I, I've, I blatantly now like the House of Lords because I like, I don't like the American system where everybody is elected. You find people... Standing on very populist agendas. Yeah, and they quickly just convict anybody yes. as this serial killer to show that they're tough on crime. So I don't like everybody being elected. I can understand that. And, and certainly one could argue 
that election is not the only source of legitimacy. We don't elect our doctors, but it doesn't mean that they aren't legitimate public servants who minister exactly. to their patients very exactly. effectively. And the people but we I suppose do the elect. difficulty is that when you've got a whole chamber of parliament mm. and there are only two major parts to the legislative process, and you've got a whole chamber of parliament that is unelected, I think that there are compelling objections to that. I mean, I can see your argument. Your argument, I suppose, would be, and I think is, well, you've got the elected House of Commons, but then you've got that potential restraining, moderating, becalming influence of a second chamber made up of discerning people who are not swayed by public emotion. Yes, I can see that argument. I suppose I just think that there is a countervailing argument, which is that it is very, very difficult, not impossible, but it's very difficult in my view to justify conferring upon people who have not been elected and therefore who have no democratic mandate legislative power. But I am right, though, am I not, that they are much more likely to say on the policing bill, for example, which yes. we're coming up against, and you know we've talked about before yes. on this podcast, which proposes draconian yeah. laws yes. that will stop people like me protesting safely without potentially being criminalised. It's the House of Lords who are more likely to say, "No, this isn't okay. This is not democratic. Absolutely not," because they're not playing to, they're a not playing garrow. to a populist, you know, and. No, that's true. And, look, and it not... is made up, to be fair, you know, of a lot of very distinguished people. I remember way back in the beginning of the 1980s when the Thatcher government was introducing changes to regulations on school transport, which I think were going to make school transport considerably more expensive, and, and perhaps particularly, if I remember rightly, in sparsely populated rural areas. You know, the House of Lords interceded itself and said, this isn't fair, this is going to have a damaging effect, this is going to make life more difficult and costly for a lot of people who can't afford it. And the Lords did wage quite a battle there. So, you know, are they always on the side of the angels? Not always. There was, in my view, a horrendous period when the House of Lords, under the influence of the late Janet Young, Baroness Young, a Tory peer, was very reactionary on the subject of the gay age of consent. Mm. So on that subject, you know, there are plenty of people in the House of Lords who were, frankly, not on antediluvian and fossilised. Mm. Yes, they weren't on the side of the angels at all. But in the end, of course, the government got its way. If, if the ones we'd elected were awesome, I'd be like, let's have another... Let's have another room full of those. I don't uh, think there will amazing. ever in any uh, democracy of any size be any significant proportion of the population who would use awesome <laughs> to describe the totality of members of parliament. <laughs> if the local <sighs> MP is lucky, and there is actually some evidence of this, Deborah, if the local MP is lucky and works hard, quite a lot of his or her constituents will say, you are a first-class constituency MP. We often used to joke in the tea room at the House of Commons as colleagues that we'd met people that weekend in our constituencies who'd said, oh, I must say I do have a pretty low opinion of politicians as a whole, but you as our local MP do an excellent job. It's the rest that the problem. Mm -hmm. They so say the same we've thing. We've all had that experience. John, this exact same thing happens to female comedians. Um, every single time I have a good gig in a comedy club, uh, somebody comes up to me at the bar and goes, I don't normally find women funny, but uh, you're an exception. Ugh. I find you hilarious. hilarious. I, I have, how am I meant to... Basically, what you're saying is, I have um, I rested my bigotry for a full 15 minutes while you're on the stage. <laughs> you won me over. Are all hereditary peers male? Yes. So can a hereditary peer pass his peerage on to his daughter if his daughter is the eldest? Not if he has sons. If he has sons, the peerage has to go to the eldest or elder so son. So any son is better. So if he's got four daughters, super accomplished, yes. and they're the age of they're in their forties, but he's got one boy child who's only eight months old. Yes. That's the one that gets it. I'm afraid so. How 
unbelievably outrageous. Of course, it's monstrous. That's, it's but does the eight-month-old take it at the time, or does he have to wait till he's 21? No, he has to wait till he's 21. And then what happens to that seat in the meantime? Just nobody takes it? Nobody takes it. So it's just a dead seat until the eight-month-old is, what, literally 21, I no life, life experience. Yeah. He's on his, he's, he might be on his gap year, <laughs> but he's got a house the seats of laws. <laughs> Meanwhile, his amazing sisters, yes. one of whom, by the way, is a research scientist, yes. I've decided, yes. who is uh, in the process of curing cancer, and she will have done it. She will have done it within the year. So she doesn't get it, but her 21-year-old brother, feckless brother, yes. who is on a who is on a, a mad ramp, he's basically on a year-long binge. He gets that seat and I'm she doesn't. So. That we is need, exactly the position. If I wasn't so interested in campaigning against the whole concept of inherited peerages. I'd weigh in on the feminist front there. Yes. But the whole yes. thing, there's no there's no feminist angle in which the whole thing doesn't have to go. No. No. So although you may cling to your preference for a second chamber that is unelected because dispassionate, because mm. discerning, because not susceptible to because populist the house, influences, yeah. I don't think there is any danger of DFW, of no. Deborah Francis White, raising her banner in support of heredity. No, heredity That is not going to happen because heredity, heredity carries with it a connotation mm -hmm. of inbuilt and despicable privilege. sexism. Yeah, privilege and sexism. Privilege and sexism. Uh, yeah, and hereditary peers is bollocks. I mean, obviously, there yes. should be no I personally think peers. all hereditary peers should be removed. Of course. I was the only Conservative MP in 2007 to vote for the immediate removal of all hereditary peers, but I'm afraid that has not happened. Why were you ever a Tory? Because you don't seem to have made, you don't seem to have liked anything the Tories ever did. Did, did <laughs> well, you I've been not on a long constantly journey. look around and go, I'm really not sure I'm playing for the right team here? Well, I did start to wonder, it has to be said. Certainly by 2007, I was thinking, you know, I feel a basic loyalty to my constituency and I believe in free enterprise and the creation of wealth through a kind of capitalism but there are very, very, very many respects in which I don't identify with my party. And insofar as most Conservatives thought it was still perfectly satisfactory to have lots of hereditary peers, I thought, well, they're completely wrong about this. There's no rational basis upon which you can justify having people present in a legislative assembly by accident of birth. And I'd also prefer it to be much, much, much smaller. There is no justification whatsoever for having a second chamber that is bigger than the first. But what has tended to happen over the years is that more and more and more people have been added to it by successive governments. And although there is an attrition rate because of death, attrition has not been very effective because... Yes, people die, but people are constantly being appointed as well. But it is literally absurd that there are approximately 800 members of the House of Lords. There's just no, no basis there's just no, for it at all. No, no excuse for it. Do you think that the life peers are a bit sniffy to the hereditary peers, like, we've earned our place here? Or I think there will probably always be a bit of creative tension between the two, yes. Which isn't to say that there isn't cooperation between them on given issues. After all, people live cheek by jowl in the House of Lords as they do in the House of Commons. So people get on across party and across generations. But I think that the appointed members do tend to feel that their legitimacy is greater. There is an issue about how people are appointed. People are appointed when they're nominated by parties. They do have to be screened mm. by the House of Lords Appointments Commission. But it is relevant to note, I fear this will alarm you greatly, Deborah, that the House of Lords Appointments Commission is advisory and ultimately the Prime Minister can make a decision. So it is open to the Prime Minister either to admit someone to the Lords, even if advised against by HOLAC, the House of Lords Appointments Commission, or to prevent someone going to the Lords who is recommended by Holak. I'm not saying that that happens very often, but it can happen. And I know, for example, that Tom Watson, former Labour MP, was nominated for the House of Lords, but he was prevented from going. And I think it's an open secret that the Conservatives were determined to prevent him going to the House of Lords. And he what? has not so far gone to the House of Lords, but he was a properly nominated person by the Labour Party. And he were you in also not? Ought to have gone. 
Were you not nominated for the House of Lords? I thought you were nominated by Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott. I was nominated by the Leader of the Opposition, that's true, but I also was rejected. So Hayley Clark on Twitter asks, what if any other gender non-binary terms for lords or baronesses? So if someone came out as non-binary or uh, there was a non-binary peer uh, mooted, what would be the term? There is none. As things stand, there is none. Now, I appreciate that that rather blunt answer may be disappointing, disappointing or vexing. Yeah, yeah. Has anyone as far tried? As Hayley is concerned. But... I think it has been mooted, but the government has been very cool on the idea. So, In fact, to put it candidly, the government has said, no, they have no such plans. So at the moment, there is no different term for a non-binary person. We simply have lords, lords and ladies, barons and baronesses. You know, which is often another term. You know, the noble mm -hmm. lord, but you know, the baron so and so, the baroness. Uh, but no, so there is no such term. A question was raised on BBC Question Time probably 30 years ago about women priests. And Francis Pym, who was quite a moderate, patrician, middle-of-the-road conservative minister, said he was not keen on the idea. And he was asked, well, you know, do you... Remember? No, he didn't think necessarily forever, but, you know, he didn't feel at this time it was a reform that he would want to see. So in other words, there was no real rationale. There was no genuine values-based argument against it. He was just taking that classic conservative position that he didn't think it was necessary to have a change and therefore it was necessary not to have a change. And intellectually, that seems to me to be a very hard case to justify. It's in really indeed. just a kind of intellectual laziness that says, well, it doesn't affect me and I'm not interested, yeah. I can't be bothered, therefore it shouldn't happen, let's move on and change the subject. Whereas, in fact, if as the world is becoming more gender fluid, in, it behoves our halls of power to reflect our population. Yeah. Andrew P on Facebook says, if you could choose one person to give a peerage to, who would it be? I would be inclined to give a peerage to Marcus Rashford. Oh, I think Marcus Rashford has done call. wonderful work over the last 12 months in trying to hold the government to account and faithfully following his instincts and sticking up and speaking up and shouting out for people who are less fortunate than he is. Now, and he's won. I know, it, you know, mm -hmm. it can be said, well, it, I suspect that while he's pursuing his career as a footballer for Manchester United, he might not have the highest attendance record in the House of Lords. But if you ask me off the top of my head who that comes into my mind in recent times I would nominate, I would nominate Marcus Rashford. Now, I don't want to be unduly controversial, which gives me a little bit of elbow room, Deborah, but my suspicion is that he would sit very comfortably as a Labour peer. Mm. Yes, indeed. I hope I'm not now going to and be shot down in flames no, by I'm... the great Marcus Rashford or his agent or publicist and no. told that, in fact, you know, he's... He's a very right-wing Tory who believes in the hereditary <laughs> peerage. I think it's but very clear that he's not. That he does not. And my hunch is that his instincts are more with Labour than with the Conservative Party. And if he turns it down, I'll have it. Yes, um, I mean, yes indeed. I mean, it could be a case of pass the parcel. Yeah. What? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Jonah on Twitter asks, if you were in the House of Lords, what would you use your time in it doing? If I were there, I would be motivated by the cause of social mobility. I mean, I've long supported gender, racial, LGBT equality, and I have some interest in parliamentary reform and associated matters, which you would perhaps expect from someone who served as Speaker. I think there are reforms that could be made to strengthen our constitution, to empower Parliament, and so on and so forth. But if you ask me to pick a political issue, which I regard as a huge challenge for the country that has persisted for generations and in relation to which we've still got an enormous amount to do it's the cause of social mobility it seems to me too often how you started life dictates the course it will take and how long it will last mm. and that's wrong yes and, and there still are the policies that, that could be pursued that would improve the life chances of less fortunate people and 
I wish that the pursuit of greater fairness and wider opportunity caused Mr. Boris Alexander de Feffel Johnson to go to bed at night or to wake up in the morning in a cold sweat thinking, what am I doing to advance the cause of people less fortunate than I? Sadly, I don't think that's so. I know, it's so strange because I think uh, that's one of the mottos of the Bullington Club. So, John, finally, where would you put the House of Lords in terms of influence in British politics? Where does the Lord sit on the scale from basically irrelevant to absolute power? I would say that it sits at around three. From time to time, slightly higher. It can fluctuate or oscillate. Oh, I do like that word, oscillate. Mm. But ultimately, it's stuck at about three. It can revise, it can influence, it can give pause for thought. But does it ultimately change that much not really john this has been absolutely fascinating thank you um, it's been fun we have had a veritable canter around the course absolutely and uh thank you very much to all of our listeners for listening whether you be lords and ladies or whether you be common folk who can only aspire to that upper chamber where all sorts of mystical decisions are made. You have been listening to Absolute Power with me, Deborah Francis White. And me, John Burko. Recording facilities were provided by Spiritland, and the music was by Hannah Ledwidge. The producers for the Spontaneity Shop were Ned Sedgwick and Tom Selinsky. Absolute Power is part of the ACAST Creator Network and the House of the Guilty Feminist. For more information about this and other episodes, visit absolutepowerpodcast.com. 